Welcome, welcome back to Philosophers Now, and this is a new video, and it's called Surrogate Thinking. Okay, uh, in the past I was explaining that uh, when I start forming a family um, and go to work and everything goes busy, and then you, you get really tired, especially when you're a, when you're a parent, you get quite tired, and uh, what you what you end up doing is basically just uh, you have dinner, put the kids to, be, to, to bed, to sleep, and then you sit down on your sofa, put the TV, and then usually watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or some TV series, right? Um, it's very hard to get out of this uh, endless cycle of, of, you know, nothing beats the plan of uh, Netflix, no? So I uh, snap out of it and um, I wanted to read more books, basically. So I started reading more books, and then I went into philosophy and reading all sorts of other type of type of books. Um, sometimes uh, it's difficult to to escape this, no? And, and some people uh, are so tired and bombarded constantly by propaganda ideology, and then people would maybe prefer to that they they are told what to do, no? So today I'm going to be talking about something I call surrogate thinking, basically letting other things for you. And the typical close to my heart uh, example is uh, China, right? China and how um, parents uh, are very involved in deciding what's best for their children, like extremely. So my wife is Chinese, uh, so I have... Um, quite uh, an insight into Chinese culture. We've been together for like 14, 15 years. And then they also have uh, books. So I read this book called Wish Lanterns. It's a very interesting book if you are interested in uh, how life is in uh, for people, Chin young people, Chinese people, working that were from the 80s and 90s, born in the 80s and 90s. So basically it's our, my contemporaries basically. And, and also younger generation, and, and maybe too old. Uh, so they are described here, I believe it's eight or ten different stories, real life stories. This is not a, it's non-fiction. Uh, and what happened to each one of them. And they are sort of an archetypical type of uh, profile for the different types of uh, urban tribes and difficult, uh, different types of um, uh, people that normally you would find in, in China, right? So. Definitely recommend. I read it really quickly. Very easy read, very interesting. Okay, so that's that one, um, Witch Lanterns. And uh, so I'm not going to talk about the book, but I'm going to talk about my experience with China and what I've learned from, you know, I've been in China five, six times and, um, you know, I live the Chinese culture very, very closely. So I'm going to share that with you. So, um, in China, what happens is um, you have to be since since Confucian times, you know, since I'm talking two, three thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, more or less. Um, you are um, focused on studying, right? You, a child is born, and a child from birth, you're gonna be uh, fully focused on uh, steering your career toward a very good university. There's a huge competition in China. You can imagine how many millions of Chinese students enter university every year. And they have the famous uh, exam to access the university. And um, there is a lot of things, like you, you have a family book called Huko. And the Huko, if you have a Huko from, from Beijing, from the capital, then you are very privileged because then you have priority to to a Beijing uh, university. There are some quotas for people outside of Beijing to be able to go to Beijing. And uh, if you don't have the right hookah, then it's very hard for you. So if you want to make it big, you want to be in an amazing university and guarantee sort of uh, guarantee your uh, success, then you have to be the best of the best. So you have to fully compete. So th they will have all people from the farms and all the villages in rural areas like focus their entire life to for, to take this exam. And there are lots of documentaries, amazing documentaries from BBC and others uh, talking about this. It's, it's a, a very interesting topic. So they will sacrifice everything, basically. They will, my wife herself, she was in, uh, in Beijing and she already had the hookah from Beijing. So uh, 
she already had a, a slight advantage, but still she had to go to school Monday to Saturday, so Monday to Friday, and then you have extra class, uh, extra the whole day of Saturday also studying, and most people also have private academy on, on the Sundays as well, so it's basically non-stop, every single day study from, basically from you ent when you enter school to university, and then at university, obviously, no? So, this is quite, quite interesting, no? So, so the, the, the plan is, you study, um, uh, you don't get distracted by romantic relationships, so usually that's super strict, it's completely banned to have um, uh, a love interest uh, before getting into university, so um, parents and teachers, uh, everybody gets really involved to make sure that they to break any kind of early relationship and and you know you cannot imagine you, how, how bad it is and, and then the plan is after all that work all that hard work if you make it if you get to a good university then you do your degree and as soon as you get your degree you're gonna get an amazing job that you're gonna is gonna sort you out for the rest of your life you as soon as you finish university you should try to get married and have children right I have one or more children i don't know if you know but the one child policy is gone now so you can have as many as you like um i don't know if it's completely true but i know at least you can have two children no problem at all no matter where you are uh, i don't know about more than that um also minorities were always excluded from the single child policy so minorities could always have as many and people in rural areas uh, in china can also have as many and there are many rules about this but all those rules are gone have children right so so that's the plan and the plan is i'm gonna have a job and i'm gonna buy a house if i'm a man i have to buy a house a flat so that i can get married quick right before it's too late right for men it's not so much of a problem because well you don't so much of a problem because then you you can wait right you can uh, build up the savings and then buy the flat then when you get the flat then you can get married and for the for the girls for the women are, are, if you didn't get married by 30 you failed in life, right? You are out, you are the discarded ones. And you never, you will die alone, basically. And if uh, you are 26 years old and you're still not married, with 26 years old, you're still not married, the entire family is in red alert and they have all these apps and by the street, they have this kind of uh, book where you have all, the, I have this book, uh, you know, all this flat, all this money, properties and stuff, I have this degree, marry me, right? And the photo, no? And the, the lady, the girl would say, you know, I have all these degrees and I have some money, properties and stuff, or that's less important for women apparently. And, and then, you know, and very pretty and, you know, very healthy, you know, have, uh, I will bear your children, whatever, right? And, and even my wife went through that because she, you know, she was not in a relationship after the university and, I mean, it's, uh, that's the plan, no? So the plan is that everything has been done for you, you know, you, you have to follow this plan and, and then uh, you get a job and the, suddenly you wake up one day and you're 50 years old and you realize that you're just about to soon, like 55 years old, something like that, and you have never done a single meaningful decision in your life. Everything has been chosen for you. However, you have children. So now you're going to make all the decisions for your children. So your children are going to have to do all the stuff that you, you do for them. So basically, it's a bit like living by proxy. It's a quite interesting way of doing things. Uh, you know, I couldn't say I agree, but, but you know, it's a very, very interesting way. I'm very, very homogeneous, you know, everybody's doing that. So, what else, what else? Um, yes, so, the, I, how do Chinese uh, teach? Um, we we're talking about surrogate thinking, you know? so how do they teach in, in a school? And this is very interesting. So, what they do is, for example, let's say you're in high school and you're... Uh, uh, study linear equations. Now today we're going to learn linear equations, right? And, and in China they will always teach the entire curriculum, you know, no more, no less, you know, maybe some more, but, but for sure you will go through everything. And then, okay, today is linear equation. So they will, the teacher would say, this is the linear equation, this is the, the theory, you know, uh, please uh, copy the theory and then repeat it aloud three times. And you say, uh, the linear equation is blah, 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 blah. You finish, everybody finish uh, repeating it aloud. Okay, again, linear equations, blah, blah, blah. You do it like three times. And then, okay, now, 
So this is how you solve uh, linear equations. Do it now. And then you go and you copy what the teacher has uh, told and then uh, they will um, uh, say, okay, now uh, you know how to do linear equations, you go back home and this is the worksheet with many, many pages doing the same thing over and over with different numbers and everything, different problems. And then you go home and then you spend a few hours doing linear equations. Then you go the next day in the morning, you review the homework okay uh, it was like this this is the answer and now you know you know linear equations next topic and then they will never talk about linear equations anymore you know that's it you, you spend one day topic covered move to the next one so the the the, the thing the thing with this uh, methodology it's quite tough but uh, the way it's like it's like a b c you know i'm telling you a you learn A, then B, B, C, C, and and you know very well how to do A, B, and C. But then you don't really understand what you're doing. I think you don't really see the connections. You don't have this kind of creativity. It kills creativity, right? So it's very interesting also for humanities, right? But humanities is even worse, right? Because it's just all memorizing, you know, memorizing the poem from the ancient literature thing. Uh, and you, everybody, all Chinese people know the poems and uh, by heart or all, you know, everything that is memorizing, you just memorize and you then, when you go to the exam, uh, ah, this is important. When you go to the exam, they will ask you the same thing that they, they taught you, right? So, they ask you about linear equations, you did the kind of exam, uh, example of a linear equation. In the exam, the, the question for the exam, the problem will be almost identical to the one, to the one that uh, you got presented to. Nothing that you have to use, like in Europe, for example, you, they will tell you this is how things work and blah. And then in the exam, you put something completely different where you have to they really check if you, if you have uh, understood. And if you can come up with something new out of, out of your bag, that's no, no. In, in China, they will uh, say, you know, it's only fair. We told you ABC, we're going to ask you ABC. There's no secret option D or anything like that. Don't worry, there's not going to be three questions or anything like that. So when then Chinese students, they, they come to Europe for a university or for a, a postgrad degree, a master's degree, then they struggle. Well, they struggle. They struggle a lot because uh, if they are not careful, when they go to the exam and then there's nothing that they have been from the examples that uh, from from lecture, they are lost, right? And that happened to me in Imperial College when I was there, and some of my Chinese colleagues, uh, classmates, they were like, poof, like I don't know what to do, and they were just staring for the entire duration of the exam, looking at the infinity, uh, staring at the infinity, and just basically the empty sheet, you know, and then we just fail. Because they couldn't understand what, they, what they, they were saying. All of them, they were telling me why they want, you know, wh what do they want? You know, do they want linear equations or do they want this? They couldn't make the connection of uh, this or that. They, they were missing that bit. On the other hand, nobody can say that they are not hardworking and that they don't know a lot. Because in all, like a PISA report in my article I put in the PISA report uh, from the OECD, they, uh, they are always at the top, right? The, the top with the highest scores, and they're very good at mathematics, mental math, and it's amazing, right? So it has pros and cons. So all this creativity is great, and I am very creative person. I, I really appreciate creativity, and I think it's import super important. But also you have all this huge, solid foundation from the Chinese schools, like they're really, you will know a lot, and you will know the procedure, how to demonstrate things, and all this kind of thing. So that's pretty good. So go, going back to going back to surrogate thinking, what I call that, you know, people telling you what to do and you you say, yeah, that's what I want. I want someone to tell me what to do with my life. You know, I don't who am I to to make the right decision? You know, it's too much pressure. So uh, with social media and with all the media, we get bombarded all the time with propaganda, ideology, like I recommend uh, Slavoj Zizek's uh, Pervert's Guide to Ideology, which is a documentary. Uh, it's like two hours long, I think, but it's amazing, you know, and it's on YouTube for free. You can just have a look. Um, 
it explains into great detail and in a very fun way what ideology is and how they are shoving it down your throat uh, day in day out so yeah you know in the article i was talking about a, a, a case that happened at the time with with a with a girl called um, cassandra cassandra vera uh, she's actually she was a trans person as well so uh, maybe they 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 were extra mean and extra harsh on her because of that. And what happened is she made two jokes uh, on Twitter. Uh, she's a Spanish and she made two jokes on Twitter about, uh, about that jokes that are, have been pretty much uh, said in the past uh, and, and about the murder of a fascist dictator that we had in Spain that died uh, in a, they put a bomb in his car uh, 43 years ago and uh, by group terrorist uh, ETA and basically she made two jokes about it uh, you know just two jokes and then they they sentenced her to one year in prison and more importantly seven years of n no they ca she cannot be in public service so she cannot be a teacher she wanted to be a teacher a history teacher now she cannot even if she doesn't go to prison in the end uh, she won't be able to work as a, as a teacher. Um, so, you know, basically they ruined the, her life because of that. So you can imagine all this social media lynching and it, it was incredible. So what I propose also in the article, because it was quite a long article, probably my longest uh, to date uh, in this day, um, is about uh, doing sort of uh, guerrilla, no? guerrilla tactics. No? Uh, uh, guerrilla no? and, and philosophical guerrilla so basically people are in this uh, slumber no? they, they are, they are um, a bit uh, numbed by the Netflix and the daily routine and then I was thinking if uh, people like you and I uh, can start interesting conversations uh, you know by the water cooler or, or whatever it is about more deep topics, you know, at the right time, you know, when it, when, it, when it suits, instead of talking about Love Island or Big Brother or these kind of things, right, you can talk football or whatever, you can talk maybe about some more meaningful things, and then that would plant a seed, no? and then in the article I also talk about uh, Nigel Warburton, who is a, a famous philosopher, a contemporary f famous philosopher here in the, in the UK, and he, he has a Twitter account, and he was saying, why not have more philosophy or philosophers on the media? You know, you have almost any idiot by the street is now on TV, right? Why not have philosophers? You know, is, uh, why not have... And I, he complained that, you know, every time they have a philosopher, they have to have this gimmick, they have to be fun, uh, jokes, and it's not really... They, you don't really do philosophy. You just put one comment uh, on one topic, and then it's all jokes about it. So it, it becomes like a comedy panel instead of a philosophy. So he was saying, yeah, you can make it uh, interesting, right? You can make it interesting without uh, making it very technical or boring. And then I was uh, joking in the, in the article saying, you know, we could end up with this kind of, uh, you know, if you, can, if you make it very trendy and very commercial, then everything gets like capitalism, no? They would get completely uh, commercialized and then we have 20 new Paulo Coelho, uh, with, uh, you know, alternative medicine and self-help books and, you know, this is your, my philosophy is the best philosophy, like the Presocratics, right? So we'll have that kind of new cycle again. Um, so, yeah, uh, in order to avoid surrogate thinking, asking people to, well, letting people tell you what to do with your life, if you have these little moments where you self-reflect or you read more books and things like that, then you can open up your mind, and then you can make more meaningful decisions. So, sorry for the topic today. I don't know, hopefully you enjoyed the insights on, on China and how things work in China. I'll tell you a bit more about that in uh, future posts. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy that. Uh, okay, so uh, leave comments, subscribe, uh, read the original article, please. It has lots of stuff in it. And uh, until the next one, bye.